ecosystems and biodiversity, we're actually going to start with a very brief film to take you into the deep sea. Welcome to the deep sea, the last vast wilderness on Earth. My name is Sean Owen, and I'm the director of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, and I will be leading you through this session today. It's a pleasure to see you all here. We have a panel of three experts on various aspects of the deep sea. It's an area that most of you, perhaps none of you, have ever visited before, and many people in the world don't even think about it on a daily basis. Until very recently, we knew very little about the deep sea. In fact, we thought it was an empty wilderness. Now we know better. And we'll hear first from Dr. Pippa Howard about just how much we know and just how much the deep sea is under threat. We'll then hear from Permanent Secretary Joshua Wycliffe from the Ministry of Environment in Fiji about what Fiji is doing and thinking about the deep sea. And we will close with some words from Matthew Gianni, the co-founder of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, on what the global status is, what the, what's going on in, in global policy, in international discussions about the deep sea. And in particular, we're here this week because Motion 69 will be voted on. Motion 69 is Deep Ocean Protection of Deep Ocean Ecosystems and Biodiversity, a call for a moratorium and we'll share more with you on this in the next 45 minutes. So without further ado, welcome all of you, and I'll hand over to Pippa. Sean, thanks very much, and I, um, I echo your welcome. It's great to see you here, and I hope we've got a, a good uh, cohort online too. So I've been um, tasked with, with speaking about the science of the deep oceans and what on earth is happening down there, what we know and what we don't know. There's been a plethora of science, uh, a number of really significant initiatives that have taken place run by the EU, for example, the MIDAS um, program, which is looking, trying to understand the science, but also the impacts and the risks of, of deep sea mining. So with this threat, we've, we've um, started to try and figure out what's going on. And as Sean says, we know very little about what is, is there, how it works, how it functions. Um, but also what will happen if, if deep sea mining takes place. So 
I'm going to start with the three main typologies of where the threat of deep sea mining is, is proposed. One is in the abyssal plains, which as Sean said, you know, many people thought had, were devoid of life. They were the deserts of the ocean, too deep, too dark, too cold, too still, um, and certainly too much pressure to hold life. But of course, what we have found uh, through the scientific programs of the likes of the Deep Ocean Science Initiative, um, which is a co collective of, of, of scientists that are focusing on the deep ocean now, that this is actually full of abundant life, remarkable creatures, very complex ecosystems, um, which we still don't understand the full function of. So if we have a look at, I'm um, sorry about the, this, you, you, you should, <laughs> it might be a bit difficult to read, but what we need to understand is if we start to um, present a, a, a seabed mining uh, proposal into the, into, these, uh, into the abyssal depths to take on and try and remove or extract polymetallic nodules, which is the key resource here that, that, that um, proponents are looking at, we will create enormous amounts of damage. So the key thing we have to understand is that polymetallic nodules are li life forms themselves. They are essentially the coral reef systems of the deep ocean. They are full of microbes. They play a vital role in the sequestration of, um, of, of carbon that sits may, may be in the sediments, but they also play a fundamental role in, in balancing the nutrients and the, and the trace metals. So if you think of a, of a, of a polymetallic nodule that's metallic, those metals have come out of the water column and are being placed in, in these concentric circles rings on the polymetallic nodules. We still don't understand how they form, so we need science to help um, us understand that better, what the genesis process is. Um, we need to know what will happen if we remove this. Now, if you have a look at what the deep sea mining activities would um, induce and, and the effects that they may have on the system, creating huge sediment plumes, for example, removing um, entire substrates, so removing an entire layer of biodiversity, uh, that's remo removing life, but we know that there are many sessile organisms that are um, basically hosted on these um, nodules. So removing those would remove entire ecosystems. Um, there's all sorts of other impacts, clearly, that come from noise, vibrations, um, magnetic resonance that will affect this. And of course, when these are removed, taken onto the ship, the vessels at the top of the ocean, uh, processed, and sediments are returned into the water column, what effect will these have? on the broader pelagic system. So we have to um, understand this better, more science is needed, but um, it's very clear already from what we know that the impacts will be huge. Let's have a look at the hydrothermal vent systems. Th these systems are where um, sulfur massives, copper sulfides, the metals that are associated with the birthing essentially of the Earth. These are um, areas of, of the ocean system that are highly unique. They're very rare, um, they're very um, uh, uh, scattered across the ocean, very, um, uh, you know, in terms of connectivity. So, if we have a look at um, the, the, basically the the, um, sign, the the ecological processes that are formed there, these are um, hosting unique life forms. As I said, this is where we have biochemical um, uh, and geochemical synthesis going on. We have. Uh, chemical processes which are devoid of life, so you know this is where life forms um, are thought to have actually evolved. So there's an extraordinary um, complexity again around these ecosystems. Were mining to happen, the removal of these systems would essentially cause extinctions. We have a number of species that were uh, listed on the, on the IUCN red list that are associated with some of these, um, so you, you know there is a, is, a, is a very real um, threat. Similarly, all the activities that are associated, light, water, uh, sorry, noise, uh, 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 sediment p um, plumes, are, are associated with these systems too. Hydrothermal vents do hold the clues to the origins of life, and some have thought that some of the antivirals that have come through um, to medicine have come from these systems too. Let's have a look at the deep sea mounts, um, which are islands of productivity. They are um, essentially uh, hotspots, biodiversity hotspots of our ocean. They're absolutely fundamental to the processes of uh, the food web, of, of the pelagic fisheries. They um, are fundamental to um, 
you know, uh, repopulating uh, different uh, systems to is where our whales go to, to feed and to breed and where, um, you know, just extraordinary complex systems work. Now, on the sea mounts, we have uh, polymetallic crusts, so um, ferromanganese crusts, which are only a maximum about 15 centimeters thick. So you can imagine that if seabed mining was to take place here, it would be a removal of these really fundamental ecosystems. So a huge loss of biodiversity, a huge impact to ocean health, ocean function, um, and, and the sort of processes that are, are happening here. Again, sediment plumes, noise, vibrations, light would have an impact on the species that are associated with these. So if we have a look at um, the operating in these unknowns, we do know some, some things. We know enough to know that this is highly damaging, of course. But we also need to know more. So we need to um, support science. We need um, independent scientific discovery and research because much of the science today is tethered to corporate interests and to uh, trying to, um, you know, the explorations are, are associated with some of the contracts that are, um, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the contracts that, 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 that companies and countries may have. So let's just have a look at some of the, these are some of the machinery that is, pos uh, is proposed to be used um, in the ocean. Um, but just more importantly, the number of, of countries and, and contracts that are actually um, approved and, and are, are not, not, not for mining yet, this is for exploration by different com countries across the globe. So this is not just a localized issue. Um, it's, it's something that is spread through all of our oceans. And you know, currently, the focus is on the clarion clipton zone, but quite a lot of activity taking place in the Indian Ocean, too. So you can see that polymetallic nodules are the blue. Uh, polymetallic sulfides and these hydrothermal vents are associated a lot uh, with the, geo, um, the, the, the plates that, that um, and, and, and the cobalt-rich crusts, which are associated with sea mounts. Just in terms of scale, the poly, uh, sorry, the clarion clipperton fractured zone, if you overlaid it with the US, we're talking about massive um, scale impacts. So how do, the, uh, how do we understand, how we, do we get better science to understand what the scale of these impacts might be? Because each of those concessions or, or, or contract areas is about 75,000 square kilometers. And uh, so it gives you an idea of the scale of this and the distribution across the Pacific. So FFI has um, authored a, a report uh, on the risks and impacts of seabed mining. We've got a couple of copies at the DSCC stand around the corner, um, but it is online too. Um, but importantly, just to echo uh, Sean's uh, call for support of the uh, Motion 69, which is, is going to be voted on in, in, in the next week or so. So a massively rapid flash through the science and, and some of the, the you know what is needed, what we know or don't know. Um, and just to emphasize just how vulnerable these oceans uh, systems are and how important it is to um, yeah to, to essentially raise these issues so thanks um, Sean thank you very much Pippa um, please f take a seat thank you with that with a very quick and very deep dive into the deep sea I would like to hand the microphone over to our second guest Permanent Secretary Joshua Wycliffe from Fiji. Thank you, Sean. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, fellow conservation uh, partners, uh, I bring you greetings from the Isles of Fiji. And uh, it's a great honor and a privilege to be here today and to share what Fiji is doing and Fiji's stand on this um, whole uh, deep sea mining uh, <coughs> matter. Um, just to start with, uh, Fiji wants to reaffirm its support uh, and its strong support indeed for Motion 69. And Fiji is one of the global leaders that um, stand ahead of the rest of the world in putting in a 10-year moratorium announced a couple of years ago by the Prime Minister, by Nimarama, until a proper research and um, scientific studies uh, establish uh, the pros and cons of uh, such an activity and of course the bearing it has on our economic zones. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as an island nation, um, a threat to our oceans is a threat to our very existence, uh, our islands, our way of life 
as, as Pacific Islanders. Our oceans, um, of course, play critical roles in, uh, <coughs> in providing us uh, and also preserving us. And uh, of course, biodiversity and supporting uh, our livelihoods and sustainable development. Uh, just imagine as a time as this in a pandemic when there are, uh, there's a loss in employment. People fall back on the traditional lifestyles and the traditional livelihoods. I was talking to um, someone on the, on, 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 the, on the plane the other day and she told half her employees were left without jobs during the pandemic. And the first thing they went back to was their coastal communities to go back fishing. And any activity that mucks around in the oceans have immediate or in the long run impacts on our coastal line as well. We had a job loss of 35% in Fiji and we had most of them go back to their coastal communities for their livelihoods. Ocean reliant activities are intrins intrinsically linked to our health, our wealth, our history, culture, identity and as a nation and a region any activity like I said that mucks around the ocean inside in the deep has immediate bearing on our lives and our health and our history and our culture. The coastal erosion that happens due to climate change today has, is starting to displace communities. We've already started relocating communities to higher grounds. To stop them, we are spending millions of dollars in constructing, er, erecting um, seawalls, including nature-based solutions around communities to protect them and to preserve the biodiversity and food security around our coastal communities. Any deep sea mining or any activity that's detrimental to this, Fiji stands against it and will not support such an activity because it has direct impact on our lives and um, <clears throat> as I mentioned it bears a, a lot of this impact that we bear is not only just because of our activity for instance we uh, Fiji's contribution towards global emission is 0 0.0004 percent and our contributions to plastic waste mismanaged plastic waste is just one percent However, the damage we bear and the impact we have year after year is much, much more than what we contribute towards climate change and the emissions. Deep sea mining is only going to aggravate this tenfold. And now you see why Fiji does not support it. And any, like any other small island state, we bear the brunt of such activities year after year and there seems to be no end. Lastly, what I'd like to do is to say what we'd like to do in this 10 years and what we've already, already started doing it. We mean, when we say something, we mean what we say. We match our actions with our words in Fiji. And so, because words matter. And one of those things the Prime Minister did uh, mention was he would like to see a, an alliance formed internationally, an alliance of leadership that will put in actual measures and actions in place. And much of these actions are rooted towards the studies that are to be conducted. For instance, um, we'd like to see, even before this is being spoken about, what impact it will have on our coastal lives, how it would influence. So we want to, need, we want to, we want to study, we want to know what the exact impact is with quantified studies that would provide us input and provide us some form of guidance to be able to stand up and say this is why, like you see me today talking to you very subjectively saying communities are being moved, coastlines coast are being eroded. I'd like to see, I'd like to be able to stand up and say in a couple of years time to say how much in numbers it affects each of our Pacific Island states. So that's something that has not happened to a deep extent, we'd like to see that happen. And we'd also like to see how we can raise alternative means of um, of support activities if we didn't have the economic, uh, economic pressures that most multinationals would like to place on Fiji by trying to deep, uh, you know, deep sea mine, mi do the mining deep seas. And also we'd like to see how we can raise enough awareness and communication to our public. We want our public to stand behind us. And to, the, to our end, listening to some of the information that was just uh, relayed by Pippa and of course Sean, it's just an eye-opener, and I'd like to see our community see it, the public to see it, to learn and understand the effects that this would have in a quantified manner, not just subjectively or quali qualitatively. And that would not just help us communicate and raise awareness, but would build a strong coalition. And Fiji cannot do on its, anything on its own.
Fiji needs a coalition. As a government, we'd like to support any coalition that will be formed in this direction, um, both through our resources, through our intelligence, through our knowledge, and of course, through the work that we can put in. And we're also prepared to lobby our fellow uh, governments, our friends, um, both in the region and internationally, to be able to support us in this initiative that we would like to. Fiji has already gone several steps ahead in trying to do something about learning and studying. I was mentioning earlier today, we intend to purchase um, understudy, underwater study, deep sea water studies mechanisms, and also laboratories and submarines that will provide us with quantified data, which we can use it for ourselves and share with a coalition. So we strongly support a coalition of um, like-minded partners, both within the NGO, CSO, and the public sector groups, and of course the private sector groups as well. That will not only help us mobilize resources, I mean, I was even going to the extent of suggesting, why, do not, why don't we speak to mining companies, both terrestrial, especially terrestrial ones, who can support, who can work with us, who can see the way we see it, and be able to provide, even if you are able to get one or two people on board, I'm talking about terrestrial mining companies, who, can, who have experienced mining, who know what mining is, who, who are in the business to come and tell us and support us. And also other businesses, other sectors where they can help us raise mobilized funds and finances to raise the awareness. That will go a long way in determining what this is all about and how this is going to affect the lives of small island states like us. So those words, I'd like to thank uh, Sean and the team for giving us an opportunity to come and voice our concerns and also show our support to Motion 69. Thank you. Hi. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Gianni, co-founder of the uh, Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. Just want to give you a little bit of a perspective on what's happening internationally on deep sea bed mining. Ah, okay, here we go. Um, some of you may have heard of the International Seabed Authority, but if you haven't heard about it or heard of it, let me explain very quickly. The International Seabed Authority was set up in 1994 as a multilateral uh, management organization to regulate mining in the deep ocean in areas beyond national jurisdiction. That's about half of the seabed of the world's ocean and the majority of the deep sea areas of the world's ocean. Uh, the International Seabed Authority consists of 170, 167 countries plus the European Union. So it's a body, an autonomous international regulatory body established under the Law of the Sea Convention um, with 167 members plus the European Union. Um, uh, you can't find it up. No, no, it's, it's a separate uh, file altogether. The one I gave you? Um, and the Seabed Authority has now already issued 31 licenses for exploration for mineral resources, totaling about 1.5 million square kilometers of deep ocean seabed, primarily in the Pacific Ocean, but also along ridge systems in the Atlantic and in the Indian Ocean, and on seamounts in the Northwest Pacific and in the South, um, East, uh, Southwest Atlantic. And the country members of the International Seabed Authority are now negotiating rules and regulations, the so-called mining code that will allow for commercial mining to begin in as little as two years. Um, why is this something that we should be concerned about? Well, first of all, as Pippa has, has indicated, um, uh, the environmental impacts of deep sea bed mining are likely to be very significant. Uh, scientists have warned, basically to summarize what Pippa said, that biodiversity loss will be inevitable if deep sea bed mining is permitted to occur. The loss will be irreversible on human timescales, hundreds to thousands to millions of years, depending on the types of species and ecosystems involved. Um, and biodiversity offsets are meaningless, scientifically meaningless in the deep sea. You, can't, you need to offset like for like, and it's just not possible to do so in the deep sea, especially given the recovery times. Um, the International Seabed Authority, as well, as a regulatory bottom which we have come to realize has some serious weaknesses to it. 
Um, the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition has had observer status with the International Seabed Authority since 2014. Myself and colleagues have been going to meetings of the Seabed Authority every year, plus a whole range of different workshops and scientific uh, seminars and so forth on deep sea bed mining. And what we've come to conclude about the regulatory structure of the International Seabed Authority is that it is heavily biased to issuing mining licenses. The decision-making process, for example, of the Seabed Authority would allow as few as two countries to block the other 166 countries, or 165 plus the EU, from preventing or halting a mining licenses going forward. Uh, and this, I won't go into the description of how arcane this, this decision-making process is, but it's very undemocratic and it's very non-transparent. There are other clauses in the bylaws of the International Seabed Authority that are established in the Law of the Sea Convention that also bias it toward mining. For example, uh, the Seabed Authority has to give every country the opportunity to mine. And this was actually quite a noble uh, progressive idea in the 1970s when the Seabed Authority was being negotiated or when the international regime for the management of mining in the, in, in the international areas of the ocean. The idea being that every country should have an opportunity to mine, not just the rich countries that have the technological capability and the financial wherewithal. However, now, from what we know now in 2021, as opposed to the mid-1970s, if every country is given a license to mine, and the ISA is not in a strong position to say no to any country that applies for a license to mine, it would be a total ecological disaster. You would need 167 mines for all countries to have an equal opportunity to benefit from the mining, and it's simply not even physically possible, uh, and ecologically, it's off the charts. So. Um, but a third element of the ISA, it's not all bad news. The, the legal regime for mining the deep sea, established under the Law of the Sea Convention, requires the country members of the International Seabed Authority to act for the benefit of and act on behalf of all humankind as a whole. So they need a social license to mine. That's our interpretation of those provisions of the Law of the Sea Convention that you cannot just issue mining licenses for the benefit of a one country or a few countries or a few companies that want to mine. Any decisions taken by the ISA have to be demonstrably beneficial for all of us, all countries, all people, and not just the handful of states and the handful of companies that to date want to mine. And just to give you an idea of how big these mining uh, areas will be, this is the area of greatest commercial interest to the mining industry at the moment. The International Seabed Authority has issued 17 exploration licenses in this area, all these colored areas, and more are likely to come. Uh, these are the countries that have gotten those licenses, either for themselves, such as France, for the IFREMER, the National Marine Research Institute, or, for example, Nauru, that has gotten a license for a private company called Deep Green that will be listing soon on the NASDAQ stock exchange and valued at a a price of about $2.9 billion that is very anxious to start going mining and get a license from the ISA to do so. And this area is roughly this size in relation to North America. So we're talking about a very large area that could potentially be impacted by deep sea bed mining. Uh, each of these license areas are roughly 75,000 square kilometers. The mining would occur over an area of, a, of some 10 to 12,000 square kilometers of seabed uh, over the course of a 30-year mining operation with knock-on effects across the seabed over, the over another 10 to 30,000 square kilometers based on estimates from scientists. And of course, water column impacts on the types of species that Pip uh, uh, mentioned as a result of noise, toxins in the marine environment, the, 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 the discharge of sediment and mining finds and so forth. So for these reasons, the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition uh, uh, our, our partners uh, have put forward a motion 69 led by uh, Fauna and Flora International to call for a moratorium on deep sea bed mining and a moratorium on the development of the regulations to, until one, we have a much better scientific understanding of what the risks are and whether, if at all, this type of activity could be permitted in the deep sea and if so, where and under what conditions. Right now, the ISA and the governments of the ISA do not have enough information by far to make informed decisions. Number two, we're calling for reform of the ISA. You need to change the voting structure. 
You need to change some of these clauses, for example, the use it or lose it clauses, that after a certain number of years of exploration, some countries are going to face the prospect of either having to go mining or losing their claims altogether. And that's an added incentive to mine. And the, 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 you know, uh, the transparency provisions of the ISA that allows its main advisory board, body to meet behind closed doors, issue recommendations that it is very difficult to overturn because of the voting structure without having to justify them or tell you exactly why they've done that. And this applies to mining licenses. And, and coming back to the, the, the social license side of things, um, you know, this, this resolution is very important. This is the first time, uh, well, let me just say that, and now the, there's an even greater urgency because the, the, the government of Nauru, Pacific Island Nation, has triggered a so-called two-year rule, which means that the ICA has to decide in the next two years whether to complete the regulations for, to allow for commercial mining so that Deep Green, the company that, that, that Nauru has licensed, has sponsored, can, can apply for a license, which they're almost guaranteed to get. Or if the ISA does not complete the regulations in two years, then Nauru, then Deep Green may get a provisional license anyway to go ahead and start mining. And so we're saying you have to put the brakes on this process. The world is not ready to mine. The world doesn't even know enough, have enough information to actually move forward with this industry. And we need governments to step in and make this happen. Fiji has indicated they're supporting a moratorium. We were pleased this morning that the German Federal Ministry of the Environment has come out and supported the moratorium in our contact group negotiations. We're hopeful that other countries will come out on this. And this is the first global conference that's taking place since Nauru triggered this rule. And countries are now scrambling to decide, what do we do? Do we have to hand out mining licenses in two years, one way or the other, or is there any way to stop it? And the second thing we hope to accomplish with, with resolution uh, motion 69 is to, is, to, is to indicate, to send a signal to countries that they don't have a social license to start moving ahead with mining. That many NGOs, many civil society organizations across a wide spectrum of interests are supporting Resolution 69 for the reasons we've outlined and in, in which are articulated in the, in the language of the resolution. It's fairly short. I would encourage any of you to, uh, to, to read it. So we need to send a signal that if the ISA is to operate for the benefit of humankind as a whole, they need to listen to the voices of civil society organizations, indigenous groups, and the marine conservation organizations that are gathered here to say, wait a minute, we want you to stop moving forward like you're moving. Sit back, think about what you're doing, and amend the provisions of the Law of the Sea Convention if necessary. Certainly, the, and, and, and the reality is they already did it once. The negotiations in the 1970s to produce the international regime for mining in the international portions of the world's oceans was renegotiated in 1994 at the behest of the United States and other developed countries because they thought developing countries had gotten too good a deal out of the 1970s negotiations. Unfortunately, or well, not surprisingly, uh, much of what they renegotiated made it even worse. But the reality is we're in 2021, over, as many of you know, over 80 heads of state, the CEO of the Global Environment Facility, the, the head of the World Bank have all signed the leader's pledge to halt and reverse biodiversity loss by 2030 at the UN Biodiversity Summit in September of last year. There actually were very strong commitments to halt and reverse biodiversity loss that came out of the Rio Plus 20 conference in 2012. And so what we're saying, you need to now align the objectives of this global body uh, to current thinking, current understanding, current political commitments on sustainable development, uh, preventing biodiversity loss, biodiversity conservation, make the right decision, put the brakes on this process, maybe come back in 10 or 20 years when you've got a lot more science and then decide whether in fact the mining could occur or whether we just simply ban it all together. But right now, governments are moving in the direction and they really need to hear from all of you and others here at the conference that, they, that, that we want them to slow this down and not be jumping into any decisions in the next two or three years. So I'll, I'll end it there and I guess we open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Take a seat, um, take a seat beside Peppa, please. So we've dived into the deep with Pippa. We've heard about leadership from Fiji. We've heard about the situation at the international policy level from Matt. Does anyone have any thoughts, any comments, any questions? 
Yes, I'm going to walk the microphone uh, back through to you. Thank you. Thank you. Oop. That's loud. Thank you very much, and thanks to all the panelists. Um, as you all know, we're currently in the hopefully what is the final stretch of uh, oh the panelists. Yeah. Uh, um, so I will translate okay, will for Matt. It. If the question is to Matt, then I will I will feed it through to okay, him. Okay. Thank you. I'll keep it short. We're negotiating a treaty to protect biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, I, I believe we haven't figured out how the new treaty will interact with existing sectoral management bodies such as the ISA. Do you have any prediction on how the two instruments could uh, interact constructively? Okay. Uh, thank you. You have a very good question. Um, well, you know, this is an interesting question, and we're, we're, we're trying to promote a recognition there as well. As you know, the BBNJ process is a process established by the United Nations under the auspices of the UN General Assembly to negotiate a new global agreement for the conservation and management, uh, conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And the same countries involved in those negotiations are largely involved in the negotiations at the ISA negotiating a new instrument under the law of the sea convention, in this case the mining code, that will lead inevitably to biodiversity loss in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So we're trying to say the right hand needs to know what the left hand is doing. But more importantly, I think most of the member nations of the UN are involved in the BBNJ negotiations. One of the real weaknesses of the International Seabed Authority is that only about half of the member countries actually show up to the meetings. And so that gives a kind of a home court advantage to the mining interests to be able to push through mining regulations because much of the rest of the world isn't paying attention to what's going on down there. And again, the World Conservation Congress is a great opportunity to raise awareness with environment ministries. The CBD coming up is another uh, opportunity to say, hey, you know, contracting parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity in your coastal and marine decisions, in your global biodiversity framework decisions, you need to be calling for a moratorium on deep sea bed mining. Biodiversity loss will inevitably occur, et cetera. Um, and, and that's what we're hoping to, to try to use the BBNJ process for, the CBD process for, the UN Ocean Conference uh, next year in, 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 in June of 2022, and ultimately get a decision out of the ISA member countries as participants at the ISA to put the brakes on the process. Thank you for that question and for your response, Matt. Any other questions or comments? I, th I think we've shocked everybody into submission. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah it, it, it's a very stark reality and actually taking you through, you know, not only the governance aspects, which are so uh, fraught with, with difficulties right now, but also the pace that things are, the pressures are coming on by the two-year rule trigger, by, by um, y you know, the, the, the lack of engagement and the social license to operate. Most of us don't know that actually this is even um, a, a, a proposed industry, let alone know, know what the, what the uh, ramifications and repercussions might be. And just to add, Sean, if I may, to if we, if we think of oceans are, con are connective, they're a continuous system, they are absolutely fundamental, they're the lungs and the, and the heart of our planet. And when an, when an impact from a, one of those um, um, concessions takes place it, it's connected through through big ocean systems um, not only around the oceans but you know three-dimensionally you know through the water column and and can spread through throughout um, um, the global system also the, the kind of fundamental role that, that the oceans play in climate regulation and the whole biological pump is at risk and we know from bottom trawling what the effects of um, loss of sediments are, are doing to the kind of climate sequestration potential of our ocean beds. So, you know, this is disrupting when tens of thousands of kilometers the system. We don't understand, I don't think, what the repercussions are. And I remember first time I sort of started to really get into the, into the nuts and bolts of the science of, of seabed mining. I thought this is this is worse than climate change. If our oceans fail, we we will fail the planetary processes of our of our whole uh, you know the system will fail. So, yeah, it's all a bit scary actually. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Pippa. Yes. Hi. I don't know if you covered this because I don't have headphones in, but my question is, 
There are deep sea bed mining companies this Friday. Uh, deep Green became the metals company, and they've been very outspoken, uh, saying polymetallic nodules are just down there for the taking. They're kind of just rocks just sitting there like dead potatoes. Um, is that true? And <laughs> are they just down there for the taking? And they say this process is relatively sustainable. Um, can there be a sustainable way to mine these nodules? And what will it actually do to these ecosystems? I know you mentioned a little bit beforehand, but specifically on that. Thank you. Thanks, Vassar. I'll, I'll respond to that. In it. So, no, they're not inert systems. They are, they are substrates for very complex ecosystems. And they may be microbes, they may be bacteria, they may be you know, very tiny, we can't see them, but they're playing a fundamental role in the whole ecosystem function um, of, of our oceans. Um, removing them would be removing those, those fundamental s processes, actually, from, from, from our oceans. Um, there has been a statement that it's like plucking golf balls off a driving range, which kind of just says it all, doesn't it? And um, so, no, the, the, the implications are very, um, are, are very serious, but also we don't really understand this, the role that those microbes are playing in, in the regulation of trace metals, of nutrients, of, of the whole um, chemical composition of our oceans that allows life to take place in the first place. So um, one likening I've said, and without being tr too dramatic, is that, that actually using these polymetallic nodules will be like you in making cement out of coral reef systems. You know, it's just it's that it's that type of analogy, and and it would be removing the sort of kidneys and liver from our from our from our from our system. So. You know the, the function of those it still needs to be explored more. We need to, you know, there's a lot more science that needs to be done. But what the clarity of, of knowledge now is that, as Matt said, impacts are irreversible. They're very long term. These are not. Uh, um, you can't uh, restore or offset these. So the application of the mitigation hierarchy that you would apply in, in any sort of mining, terrestrial mining uh, situation just does not apply in the ocean. These are permanent geological time frames that we're talking about in terms of the impacts. Yeah, if I could just add to what Pip is saying, another aspect of, this is another issue in relation to the reform of the ISA that we're calling on, because the, there is language in the Law of the Sea Convention in Article 145, which is part of the seabed mining provisions, that says that the ISA must ensure effective protection of the marine environment from harmful effects of mining activities and must prevent damage to the flora and fauna of the marine environment. And that was back in the 70s they negotiated this when they basically were only looking at the nodules and basically the view of that particular part of the world, the deep abyssal plains, was it was an area, a vast area of rocks and mud with maybe a few worms crawling around in it, but not much else. Fast forward to 2021 and the scientists are saying this is one of the most biologically diverse areas of the deep sea. And there will be significant damage to biodiversity as a result. It may not be high in abundance in terms of the actual numbers of, of animals there, but it's a highly diverse ecosystem. And so one of the debates at the International Seabed Authority is, well, you know, how can we bend the rules so we can get around this Article 145 and say, we're just going to go ahead and start mining anyway, and we'll call the damage to the marine environment acceptable damage or okay damage. And again, when you look at the scale of these operations, you realize it's simply not possible to do so. So we do have tools, legal tools, to push back on what governments are trying to negotiate at the ISA, but it's ultimately going to be a political decision. And, and that's where we really need the help from organizations here and, and you know, through voting yes on motion 69 and then pursuing this issue, pushing this ahead with this issue at the CBED and in other forum. Thank you, Matt. If there are no other questions from the floor, I might pose a question myself to Permanent Secretary Wycliffe. I heard you speak earlier on uh, in a session earlier at the Nature Business Hub about the importance of working with companies as well on, on solutions. To, and I wonder if Fiji has any innovative ideas on, on that front about how, how that might look in this context. 
Thank you, Sean. Um, we've already stepped, um, taken a couple of steps uh, in that direction. What we've done is um, not into deep sea yet, but uh, into the uh, within the EZ, a couple of spots where we want to designate them as marine protected areas. Um, Fiji is now forming uh, private sector partnerships uh, with uh, conglomerates and private companies to be able to commercialize those MPAs. And how we do that is, uh, we all know that uh, marine protected areas have different categories, category five, four, three, two. So the ones that are not no-go zones, but the ones that are available for entertainment, for diving and things like that, not for fishing, um, what we've done is we've um, commercialized them. So um, these companies would charge a toll for tourists to go and have a look and see them, see what's underwater and experience the life underneath for a cost. So that's been a very attractive uh, proposition for companies and we've had investors, uh, Asian investors who put in uh, millions if not prepared even do billions into um, sea safaris, they call them sea safaris, to be able to take underwater ex um, uh, experience. Um, I was um, also thinking, when we were talking earlier today, uh, extrapolate that into deep sea as well, not disturbing the ecosystems but being able to have an opportunity to see what we saw on the video for a few minutes you know having an underwater experience and and paying and people are pay, prepared to pay costs for that and that raises the awareness and the publicity towards protecting deep sea asia uh, areas and deep sea deep sea spots so um commercialization certainly is an option there are companies who are prepared to invest um i knew i mean i was discussing with uh, in the afternoon with people and they were saying there there are efforts underway to be able to reach to private sector groups that are prepared to invest into efforts. So um, Fiji will continue to do what we're doing, uh, not just commercializing, but also get private sector partnership, partnerships, being able to build nature-based solutions um, so that um, these effects are not just put into adaptation, but also mitigate in the long term. Thank you. And maybe hand the, the microphone to Farah, uh, who is also with the DFC, DSCC working on this front. Oh, but yeah, so, well, I, um, so there's two things that strike me. One is the clock is ticking, obviously, as we've heard. We know that we have a limited time, less than two years, to stop this industry from starting. Um, and the other thing is, uh, we've heard a lot about social license, and clearly there is no social license to, to mine the deep sea. We know that within the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, we have close to 100 members from around the world, all different organizations. We know that the, the fishing sector, for example, they are expressing opposition to deep sea mining. For example, the EU advisory councils have, have, have come out and said that they're concerned about deep sea mining and they support a moratorium. Um, and we've heard from uh, the International Pole and Line Foundation, uh, they support a moratorium on deep sea mining. And there's a, there's a list which you can see on, on our website, savethehighseas.org, of all the entities that are opposed to deep sea mining. But a, a very important um, sector, and we've heard about it a bit uh, just now, is the, the business sector, right? How does industry feel about deep sea mining? And in fact, there are businesses such as Volvo, BMW, Google, Samsung, and most recently Philips that have come out and said that they support a moratorium on deep sea mining, recognizing that they, you know, that having the foresight to see that we don't need those metals going forward in our electric vehicle uh, uh, technology. Um, and they've also pledged not to source minerals from the deep ocean in their products. So we're seeing that this social license is not there across all sectors, from fisheries to businesses, from the, uh, civil society, um, and even from uh, the people that represent us, such as the European Parliament in, in, in where I live, um, so in Europe. Um, and so the question is, how can we amplify that so that our voices are really heard at the International Seabed Authority and by our governments. And so one way that I, I, I is, is a suggestion for you perhaps to consider, but it's to join our campaign at defendthedeep.org. And you can also raise your hand uh, in support of a moratorium. And also feel free to visit our booth uh, where we have a lot more information also on the ISA, how it's not fit for purpose, uh, on the alternatives uh, to, the, to the minerals um, that they're proposing to mine from the deep sea. Um, and many other information sheets. So um, I hope we can stop this industry before it starts. And I think that's the good news that we, that we can share here today. So, yes. Thank you, Farah. Yes, a question.
I'll try it this time and I hope I'm not shouting again, okay? Thank you very much for that interesting presentation. I actually have two questions. My name is Iris Siegler from Shark Project and we'll definitely support that. I wasn't really aware of that moratorium that we have to go forward, but it's definitely something we need to support. So my question to you would be, do you think that this moratorium, if we have it here at IUCN, vote for 69, if this gonna make a difference? Is it gonna be powerful enough to really stop it? That is the first question. And then I would have a question to uh, Mr. Wackleif. You really impressively showed like Fiji how 10, and it's great. I just can say thank you for that, to support that. But what I'd be interested in knowing is, you said like with marine pr protected areas, you're also supporting, you're giving away licenses, which is obviously a good way to uh, compensate. But what is your intent of how much of your waters you're going to protect into real no-take zones? Like no extraction, that's what I mean, because there's a huge debate going on. Like, do we talk about 10%? Is it highly protected? Is it uh, strictly protected? Is it no take? And there's different things circulating. So that, sorry for being long. No, thank you. That's perfect. Uh, we'll take the. I'll, I'll give the microphone to Mr. Wycliffe first to take the second question, and we'll come back to the first. Thank you for that question. Um, uh, was it? Good question too. Um, the way it goes, the MPA is being um, uh, being ad ad adopted uh, is like this. Um, we have uh, taken a, a, a stock take of our biodiversity. Our state of the environment report says what's found where, uh, kind of indicatively. So um, we don't go by uh, percentage for the sake of it, saying like I put 10% for the warm fizz words and say good, nice things. But we go by how biodiversity is uh, impacted. So uh, the least affected would of course have uh, be categorized accordingly. The, the most affected would be no take. And from what I understand, it's not yet officially done. Uh, we have not given licenses yet. The model has just been finalized uh, and it goes through the parliament. And uh, how it goes is about um, less than 30, 40 percent would be uh, a free liberal area to go around doing anything. So the no-take zone is much larger than what you have for leisure. And, uh, and so um, we're very conservative in what we do. But for the little spaces that we have, we don't give licenses to go do anything inside other than provide studies and education and awareness. So. It, kind of has a several ticks. It provides awareness and education to our local citizenry as well and to the tourists who come. And it, it boosts ecotourism as a segment. So um, that's where we stand at the moment. But good question. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, if you would pass the microphone to Matt. The first question was, uh, will this make a difference? Will the yes vote this week make a difference? Well, it can. It should. And I think it will if we get a strong vote here. Um, because again, no country has yet come out and said, maybe we need a moratorium at the ISA. There are 167 member nations, and so we've been pushing them, and a lot of them are looking to other countries to go first. And we think that if, for example, some countries come out and vote in support of 69, that already sends a signal to the other, the others that are considering it and maybe willing to do so, and act as a catalyst to bring together a group of like-minded countries that will then go into the ISA negotiations as well as the BBNJ negotiations and other negotiations and say, okay, we need to make this happen. But again, the second uh, uh, issue I would emphasize is that even if this motion loses with the state's parties, for if, if we get a strong vote from civil society organizations, that sends a very strong signal to the member nations of the ISA individually and collectively that, whoa, wait a minute, it's not just a handful of marine conservation coalitions or even the 91 members of the, the SEC, but however many votes we're able to get here at the uh, World Conservation Congress. And that only builds momentum and pressure to put on governments. And what we're hearing internally from quite a few governments, in particular EU member states, but also a number of Latin American states, and certainly the 47 member nations from Africa that are members of the ISA, that they want to slow this process down. They're starting to grapple with how do we do this? How do we interpret or renegotiate international law to ensure that we can do this? And they can. It's a question of political will. 
Um, and again, I think that uh, the IUCN World Conservation Congress in adopting 69 could really boost that political will uh, and really bring countries out of the closet or off the fence on this and, and be willing to stand up to the countries that do want to mine and say, sorry guys, you know, we're going to have to slow this down. We're, this is a bad move. This is a bad decision. We can't be doing this now. We really need more time to think about what we're doing and reconsider. A very quick final word to Pippa. No, I was just going to say, what happens um, to those who, you know, just think it shouldn't happen at all? You know, what, what, should we be delaying this or should it be banned entirely? Well, I would say if we get a moratorium, that gives the space for a serious global conversation about the science, about the regulatory body, about what the world wants to do with its global commons. And I can't help but think that, you know, what was it, 30 years ago, France, amongst others, stood up and said during the Antarctic minerals negotiations, no, we're not going to negotiate a regime to open up Antarctica to mining. We're going to set this aside as a global commons for nature protection, scientific research, understanding how it influences our planet. The same can be done for the deep sea. And in fact, from my, from my point of view, that would be a, a, a very good outcome of this process. So the moratorium may only be a moratorium at some point for, for a certain period of time if that's what governments decide, but it also could ultimately lead to a permanent agreement to set aside the deep ocean as our global commons to halt and reverse biodiversity loss in the oceans by taking a responsible, intelligent decision and saying, governments have grown up, we realize what we've been doing to this planet for the last 300 years of the Industrial Revolution. We don't need to go into the deep sea to mine these minerals. These deep sea areas are already under stress from plastics, from overfishing, from climate change impacts. We're gonna take a responsible decision and say, no, we're not gonna do this. We're gonna reverse the whole mindset, the whole international legal regime, the international multilateral cooperation around how we approach, do global decisions on protecting the planet and put words into action and say, that's it. We're, 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 we're gonna protect this area. So that's my hope anyway. But this is a step forward and hopefully uh, it'll lead to many more steps forward from here. Super, and with that, we will wrap. Thank you so much to our panelists, to Permanent Secretary Wycliffe, thank you to Pippa, thank you to Matt. I'd also like to extend our thanks to the Pew Charitable Trusts who made this possible for us, and special thanks to the IUCN Ocean and Islands team, because also fantastic work. Thank you to you all for joining us and have a wonderful rest of the conference. If you have a vote, please vote yes on 69. Bye-bye.